the study of strategic regions, which somehow um, co-organizes this, this event. Uh, I most of all and very much uh, welcome here the author, uh, Professor Kang Yi Sun Jang, who was so kind to join us on this occasion. Before I give her the microphone and ask her to say a few words, I would like to say a few words about the book, what it means for us, because it's not just, a, a, well, an occasion to translate a book of a well-known professor who, well, anybody who studies history of Chinese literature knows, uh, but it is a very special book which deserves to be read by not only all people, all students and people interested in China and Taiwan, but uh, it should be read by everybody to understand uh, from a very, let's say, down to earth, uh, ordinary perspective, uh, understand lives about people in a situation which is conditioned by animosities, uh, conflicts, uh, I say useless conflicts, uh, and uh, the life of people and how they can cope with it uh, during the Cold War, I could say, in a, in a more general uh, manner. And I already, already told my colleagues in the Cold War study group to read the book because it gives them a totally different and very important perspective on the life of people uh, in a divided world uh, and uh, living under harsh conditions. And before I end, because I think it's, it's also a wonderful book for anybody who wants to understand Taiwan. I am absolutely sure uh, one reads uh, many books and articles about Taiwan history, Taiwan society whatsoever. But Professor Kang Yi Sun Jang was able to capture the essence of the Taiwan situation, people living in Taiwan, uh, what they went through and what are their aspirations. And so I, I think this is a great book also for, for the students. And we have increasing number of students interested in Taiwan history of culture and culture. And I will end, I, I will quote from my preface to the book. I, I, sorry, I will be uh, directly from Czech, so it won't be particularly um, elegant English. Uh, uh, when reading the book of Professor Kang Yi Chang, I was reminded about uh, Czech writer Božena Jensova. She was a writer, 19th century writer, and. Uh, Kang Yi definitely uh, didn't write the book as a writer. She wrote, write, wrote the book as a witness. Never mind, I, I found something connecting her to this kind, uh, to, to this uh, person in Czech literature and her writing. And this something was uh, um, uh, an expression of uh, very basic and very human values, which I think will be with us, I hope will be with us, whatever happens in the world. And her conviction that even hard times can be lived through with decency, friendship, compassion, and that people really are not so bad as they sometimes look like, yes, <laughs> because they have these good things in their heart. And, and, and to end my comment, and this is something which I, as a person who has worked for many years uh, researching Chinese literature uh, I, and culture, I would say this is something that connects cultures universally. And we can find these values which Professor Kang Yi Sun Chang expressed in her memoir in traditional Chinese culture, but also in modern world, and in 19th century Czech culture. And we can see uh, she was able to capture something which is truly universal and deserves to be cherished. So this is my short introduction and I hope 
uh, uh, those who didn't buy the book yet will do so soon. And now I ask Professor Kang Yi Sung Jang to say a few words about her book. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Professor Olga. Can you hear me, everybody? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Olga, for such a wonderful introduction. And, and, and hi, everybody. You know, my heart, you know, my heart is very, very full at this moment. Um, and, and I wanted to, first of all, you know, thank Professor Olga and the translator, Frantishek, for their tremendous help and support over the years. Without their hard work, there will be no uh, Czech translation of my book, Journey Through the White Terror. So I am deeply grateful to them. And also to everyone uh, uh, present uh, at this, uh, on this occasion, I want to express my sincere gratitude to all of you. Uh, today, um, <clears throat> uh, I just want to share, uh, uh, to use this opportunity to, to share with you a, a, a few reflections of mine. And, and first of all, I wanted to say that I really, I really love uh, the book cover, you know, of, 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 of the Czech edition. So I wanted my assistant, uh, 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 Yang Xuechen, to share the screen, you know, so that you can see the details of, of this book, book cover. Uh, okay, did you, uh, okay, yeah. Okay, look at, yeah, look at this book cover. Amazing, you know, uh, a, a book cover, you know, this cover, uh, and, and of course the book, was, was translated by by, by twenty sec, and I I'm very um, touched, you know, by this book cover, which displays my father's praying hands. You see, you could see that, and my father actually drew this picture in the summer of 1990. That was long, long several decades, you know, after the White Terror era. That was like uh, twelve years after my parents already uh, immigrated in the US, you know, in the United States. I actually, honestly, I was so amazed when Frantishek sent me the image of this book cover, um, which I think surpassed all the previous book covers of my White Terror book. So now I wanted Xueton to share with you of the previous book covers, you know, of this book in different editions. So first of all, look at this book cover. This was the first time that this book in, uh, it was published in Chinese in mainland China. And if you look at it, the, the book has a different title. It's a, in Chinese, it's Ba Ku Nan, Shou Ru Xing Nan. And then um, I translated as a journey through hardship. There was no, uh, there was no uh, book, original book title mentioned. You know, journey through the white terror. I think it was because of a censorship or self censorship. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, I think the um, Shanghai Sanlian uh, publisher was very worried that um, uh, you know about the political connotations of white terror. And when I asked them, why are you so worried? You know, I mean, this has nothing to do with men in China. This is about Taiwan. And do you know what they said to me? They said, we are afraid of offending Taiwan. <laughs> that is very funny. Okay, so then, the, so a few months later, okay, so the next slide, uh, okay. So, um, uh, if, uh, okay, and a, a few months later, this book was, um, uh, this version, this version was published in Taiwan. And I was so lucky because that was the time, you know, that was 2002. That was a time that both China and Taiwan could publish this title, uh, that could publish uh, books on this subject. Because before that, there might be some difficulty. Okay, yeah. And then a few years later in 2007, uh, this uh, uh, a Taiwan publisher, Yunchen, Publish, you know, a, a enlarged in an enlarged edition, and it has a different book title, you know, uh, uh, book title. Okay, this time, and and this includes some book reviews, and then finally, uh, there is a 
a, an enlarged edition by the famous uh, Beijing Sunim Publishing House. And look, and, and look at this public, this is title is different. This is um, the, 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 the book cover uh, has a picture from the Green Island, the Green Island where my, my father was imprisoned you know, for a few years there in, in the Green, Green Island. And then later, the English edition came out, Journey Through the White Terror. Actually, at first, I wanted to have this book published in America, but someone, uh, uh, but, but David Wang, Wang the Wei of Harvard University persuaded me that I should have this published by National Taiwan University because it is about a story of Taiwan. So I, I follow uh, Professor uh, David Wong's um, uh, advice. And, and this was actually a, the second edition of the English um, version. I, I, I did not show you the first uh, edition because I, I really hated the, the first version. The, her, the first edition was so poorly done. I was so angry and that's why I demanded, uh, uh, you know, I, I requested the second edition. Okay, so now, now that you have seen all these previous book covers, they are so wonderful too, okay, so wonderful. But I think the book cover of the Czech edition, you know, which um, uh, Fenty Shack did for me, is very, very special because it captures my parents' spiritual strengths, uh, you know, that eventually saved our family. Because my book is really about the topic of survival and faith, you know, as Professor Olga already said, it, 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 it tells the story of a political prisoner, my father, uh, a political prison, a prisoner in Taiwan, and how he, and his family later survived in the United States as immigrants, uh, and, 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 and which involved a long journey of struggle and spiritual growth. And I really want, I'm so grateful to um, Chris Anderson here, you know, who, who, was the, um, who was the head of the special collections uh, at the Yale Divinity School, you know, before he went to Princeton last week. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, <coughs> Chris, Chris Anderson set up a collection for my father, a collection of Sun family papers in honor of my father's name. So I'm really grateful you know, to Chris, okay? Yeah. And some of you already know that, you know, I just want to say something about uh, the Taiwan white terror period. Some, some of you already know that during the period known as the white terror, Taiwan was under martial law. And both political dissidents and innocent civilians were prosecuted incarcerated and even executed under a very paranoid KMT government. Taiwan is very different now today, everybody knows. And I'm so pleased that it is so different. But in January, 1950, wow, that was, uh, that was uh, 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 more than 70 years ago. Uh, I was not even six years old when my father was arrested and imprisoned uh, in, in a, 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 a military uh, prison in Taipei. And he was later sent to the notorious Green Island concentration camp, Lü Dao, you know, Green, Green Island. And by the time my father returned, that was 10 years later, I was almost 16. So in those years, my mother held our family together. She was just an amazing woman. Uh, after my father's arrest, my mother single-handedly brought me and my two younger brothers quickly you know, from Taiwan to the countryside in Southern Taiwan, that's Kaohsiung, Kaohsiung you know, where my mother worked as a sewing teacher to keep her three children alive. So we, we really went to um, uh, Kaohsiung to hide. And it was then that I forgot my uh, Peking dialect, you know, because of trauma. So I just, because of 
of, of, of trauma, I forgot my language, you know, my mother tongue. That was a, just an amazing experience. So it is really a miracle that so many years later, my family was able to escape from the shadows of the white terror, uh, especially that my father had been so unjustly imprisoned and suffer terribly during the white terror era in Taiwan. So now my book, you know, Journey Through the White Terror is finally available in Czech, you know, uh, which brings me a lot of joy and gratitude. And thank you again, Fenty Czech and Professor Olga, okay? And I should mention that the Czech edition is very special to me. It brings back a lot of uh, important memories to me. For example, it reminds me of the moment that my father died in uh, May 2007 in uh, California. That was 14 years ago. He, de he died peacefully with no struggles and, and, and without any trace of anxiety, really very peaceful. And I remember that I was holding his hand, my father's hands until the very last moment. And this is why the book cover is so pertinent, you know, to my memories. This picture was taken a, about six months before my father died, but I just wanted to show you the hands that I was holding my father's hands. And over the years, I always felt very sad that I had not been around to hold my mother's hands when she passed away in the same hospital in California in September uh, 1997. And that was 24 years ago. How time flies, you know, just, I, it's so amazing. I mean, I mean, uh, it, it just flies. So, so, so my, my subject today is really hands, holding hands, right? And that is reflected on the book cover, you know, of the Czech edition. And so I wanted to say something that I was the one in the family who inherited my father's tough, masculine and big hands, as you can see, you know, from the picture, you know, I have, I have big hands. And and in fact, I wanted to tell you a story too. Uh, over the years, my mother often repeated the same story about how my big hands saved my family during the white terror era. What happened was this. In January, 1950, the day after Mr. Gu Zhengwen, head of the secret police, took my father away, uh, um, um, Mr. Uh, Gu came back trying to arrest my mother as well. Can you believe it? He came back the next day trying to take my mother away. We, 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 we could have become orphans. Yeah, but then the thing is, I was so desperate when he was going to take my mother away that I grabbed a big stick and hit Mr. Gu uh, really hard. And Mr. Gu was very, very angry. Mr. Gu was very, very angry. Uh, but, but then he saw that I was in tears. Uh, and, and, and he was so touched by my courage. You know, I was not even six. Okay? He was so touched by my courage and, and filial piety at such a young age that in the end, he left without arresting my mother, okay? Oh, so thank, thank God, okay. So now, more than 70 years later, uh, as I look back on this incident, I'm especially grateful that our family has survived, you know, through the white terror trauma. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for listening to my short reflections. And I'm going to speak to you again you know, uh, late, later, you know, during the question and answer period. And now I think Frenchy Shag is going to say something. Thank you. Thank you, Kangi, for sharing your recollections with us. I, I perhaps should add one sentence I didn't say in the beginning. The Taiwan, the book is appearing uh, in Prague, perhaps a little bit too late because Franciszek spent so much time uh, working on it. 
But at the same time, it appears in the time when there is a growing interest among Czech people about Taiwan. And Taiwan is becoming very, I mean, a, a center of interest of many people. So I think it's in the right moment here to, to tell something uh, um, here in Prague and, and in Czech Republic uh, to understand better uh, about mm -hmm. Taiwan. And now I, th I think I will ask František, I should ask František, the translator, to say a few words. Maybe for the beginning, I just uh, um, say that, of course, it took a long time, but it was because he was so busy with many other things. It is not because he would not be able to translate, um, I mean, the, the book uh, in a shorter time due to his abilities. And he did a great job because he not only translated, he also edited. He had the Chinese edition and the English edition, and uh, he was working with both because there were some, well, it was necessary. It was, it enriched the contents of the book. And I think he will say a few words about it, please. Thank you very much, Professor Lola. Um, yeah, first of all, hello, everybody. And uh, first of all, of course, uh, I have to thank uh, Professor Kani to, for, for writing the book in the first place because the book is really beautiful and also for helping me over the years uh providing me with many materials i remember when i was in what, shanghai in 2014 and you, you sent me uh from america a lot of materials uh, to, to use during my translation and uh, and also thanks to professor lomova for her endurance and uh, <laughs> you know patience with me because Really, the book went with me from Prague to Beijing to Shanghai to Brussels and back to Prague <laughs> before I finished it. But uh, I'm very glad it happened. And, um, you know, uh, as Professor Lomova mentioned, uh, I used both Chinese uh, and uh, English edition for uh, translating it. And this is the first thing I'd like to speak about uh, because I really believe, and, you know, it would sound like an awful self-praise but I, I really think that this is the most complete edition of the book so far uh, because I really went through both of the edition chapter by chapter paragraph by paragraph and I tried uh, to uh, include in the Czech edition you know everything that was there although and thank you for that professor you, you gave us uh, the freedom to edit the book to for, for the book to be suitable for Czech reader <clears throat> But I really thought that there's nothing really unsuitable for the Czech reader in both of the editions mm -hmm. and that I should really try to include as many information as, as possible. So there were some chapters that were only included in the English edition and vice versa. There were some chapters only included in the Chinese edition and we put both in there. Uh, just, you know, technically we were, we were working with the Chinese 2012 Sanlian edition, which was, I think, the most elaborated one and with the English 2013 edition. And also uh, we uh, put um, the list of important uh, events of professor's life and, and historical events in general, uh, which is also, I think, uh, more elaborated than in the other editions. And, and the list of characters, which is kind of complete. Uh, we really basically try to mention uh, everybody uh, every character appearing in the book, be it a historical figure or, or, or a person from a uh, professor's life. Uh, and also, Professor, thank you very much for providing me with all the additional information about the people so that I could, I could describe them, I could put their, you know, birth dates and everything. Uh, that was, that was, that was a, a big help for that. Um, and then uh, also uh, what I tried to write as an epilogue for the, for the book, because I, I really thought it's, it's kind of needed uh, for the Czech reader is uh, a kind of historical guide. And that was very uh, interesting experience actually, because <laughs> we, had, we had like a, a lot of discussions here with Professor Lomova about, about that epilogue, because I, I started big, of course. And I tried to bend as deep as possible, but then, then you know, I realized that uh, after the consultation with Professor Lomova, that going too deep is not uh, wanted in a, in a sense of, you know, it, it would make another book. 
basically. If I really try to describe all the nuances uh, about the historical conditions, uh, I would, you know, I would never stop. That was the one thing. And the other thing is, and thank you, Professor Lomova, for that. You you made me to keep to the text of the book. Uh, I just I just went too far. But in the end, I think these. I don't know, 15, 20 pages of, of the epilogue are quite enough uh, for, the, for the Czech reader to kind of understand all the conditions and to have a, a kind of like a background to, to the narration of the, of the book itself. I just try to explain just a few most important things about the I don't know, relations between Taiwan and the United States, about the identity, uh, of the language identity, uh, and you know, this is my favorite chapter actually from 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 the whole book uh, about the language identity, about the losing and finding languages again. And maybe after in the Q and A question, I'd like to uh, ask Professor to to kind of elaborate on that uh, on that uh, topic. And uh, so so yeah, I, I believe the epilogue, which is also something that the other editions don't have. Uh, Although I believe that the, the English edition has the great preface from Professor David Wang, uh, but but it's a, it's it's more like a preface, it's not not, not a historical uh, wannabe studies or whatever. So so I think this this is also a good thing for the for the Czech reader uh, to to have uh, these uh, things there. So I thought it would be uh, worth mentioning, and then. Last but not least, from like a personal perspective, I, I really love how the book is written in the, in the sense of the tone. And uh, this is something, um, when, when, I, when I read it for the first time, uh, and I must admit, because the first edition we had was in English, so I read it in English first and then in Chinese, and then both of them many times over and over. But uh, I really liked how civil and how humble the tone of the book is. And although it speaks about big historical events, it still keeps kind of personal and it's still a narration. It's still a story about a family and about some hardships. And what I can feel is some kind of like a humbleness and on, on, one, on the one hand, and on the other hand, a praise for all the characters there. And, um, this is something that, that I, I really loved about the book, how all the, all the characters uh, are described from the point of view of, um, uh, how to say, of, of praise or uh, indebtedness uh, in, in a sense, because uh, I believe, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, Professor, but I, I believe all, all those people kind of took you through all the periods of hardships and, and may, maybe who you are uh, at, at the moment. And I, I could feel it from the book and it, it made me really love it. So I, I wanted to mention that from the, from the personal point of view that it was, it was very nice for translating it. And uh, I was, I was uh, really enjoying it. So that's it, I guess, from my side. Uh, I, I may have some uh, little questions for, for, for the professor later. Okay, okay, thank you. Before before I open space for for questions for the for the audience, and I also have some questions, uh, I may uh, add uh, two small comments on what Frantisek has just said. Uh, and, uh, each edition, be it English or Chinese or Czech, speaks to a certain environment. And now I, I don't take into account the possible self-censorship or censorship in, in China. So uh, it, it, I mean by the publisher, of course, uh, as far as censorship is concerned, the, the book speaks to readers who know something about history, about uh, cultural environment. And, and of course, this reader's ability to understand is different in Taiwan, in China, uh, in the United States, and in the Czech Republic. So that, that was one of the reasons why we used both editions, and then why we decided to add this kind of uh, um, 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 short uh, overview of Taiwan history uh, focused on issues which are referred to in the book. 
to, to broaden the under, understanding. And, and the main reason why I, and I was surprised that František suddenly, who is a literary historian and a, and a good literary expert with fine sense for literature, suddenly turned into a historian. And he wanted to have a, 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 a detailed history, I mean, a history, yeah? And if, if his original text, which was very long, would be there, it would just overshadow the historical message, which is in the memoir, yeah? So because I think the memoir of uh, Professor Kang Sun Zhang uh, speaks, of course, about humans, human emotions, I would also add about the importance of literature in human life. It's uh, an important uh, aspect of the book as well, but it also speaks about history. And for people who, who are sensitive, who are open their hearts, they can understand history better than from a historical book. And of course the historical data had to be there because some things were simply hard to understand. And uh, the second uh, remark is the list of the of the of the names of the people who appear in the book. Uh, this solution was inspired <laughs> by my writing a book about medieval Chinese literature in Czech, because there were there were translations and there were many names, historical allusions and writers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I didn't want to put footnotes or endnotes all the time. So I added a list of names as a glossary in the end of the book. And we used this the same technique. And I'm, I'm proud to report to Professor Kang Yi Sung Jang, whose first book was on early medieval Chinese literature, that we use this experience of a book on early medieval Chinese literature in preparing her Czech uh, a translation of her memoir. So this is my uh, last remark. And now I think I would open uh, the space for the audience if you want to ask questions. And I will ask Jan to, um, I don't know, can you raise hands or uh, there should be a, a function to raise a hand if you want to ask a question? I certainly hope so. So let's try If There is a question, raise your hands. And if you don't have questions yet, I think I will. Or, or, yeah, or just, 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 just raise yeah. your hand like this and say okay. it. Okay, okay. Yeah. And and before we, we see the hands, I, I will ask František to ask his questions. Okay, well, thank you for letting me start. Uh, well, I have basically well, one question and uh, one uh, thing to ask. So I will start with a question, uh, which I was wondering during the translation, because uh, the, the aspect of faith is very strong in the, in the book. And, um, but what, what I kind of missed there, and I will ask, uh, ask you to, the thing is like, how did your family come across Christianity in the first place? Because yeah, it starts with your father reading the Bible and studying the Bible deeply in, in the prison. And, um, but then, then again, uh, you are talking about the uh, Presbyterian church uh, during the time your father was in the prison. So, so I guess your family was you know, closely related to, to, to the church even before. And I've always wanted to ask you that, you know, how, how that came to be, how, how did you, you know, how, how did your family start being Christians, if mm. I can put it that simply? Well, that is such a wonderful question. Actually, that, that is how our family was saved, really. Um, I mean, during the early 1950s, my mother um, brought us from Taipei, you know, to Kaohsiung. We just, we were just hiding, really. We and and and, and the uh, you know the police, you know, the secret police were sometimes following us too. And my mother became so sick, you know, because of course, you know, that she couldn't sleep, and at the same time, she had to support the kids, and then. Many times she was about to die, you know, like, like 
often during the middle uh, at night, I had to uh, uh, call, uh, I, 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 I had to go to the, the, the doctor's office and not at the doctor's uh, office, uh, you know, and, and then, so she was just miserable. And then later uh, she became a, a, a Christian because she just couldn't sleep. And then he went to her big sister's house and the big sister say, you really have to, you know, uh, you know, uh, believe in God. Otherwise, you cannot survive. And then, because of that, uh, she she just promised that she would become a Christian if she could sleep. And then later, she could sleep. And then, so she just she said, "I really have to keep my promise." And she just began to go to church. So every one of us became a Christian individually. Okay, she just became a Christian. But then I had a different story. When I was nine years old, I was so lost and actually very angry. You know, I mean, you talk about being humble and, and, and gentle, but then actually I was very upset, you know, very distressed at, at age nine. So one day I was just so lonely because we were not allowed to talk about my, the fact that my, my father was in jail. Okay. So my classmates didn't know that my father was in jail. We were not allowed to talk about it. And, and so I just, just uh, was run, uh, roaming around. And then finally, I just went to a, a church service. And I was just sit, I, I was sitting there in the back of the church. And I heard the minister, Mr. Chen, said, you should love your enemy. You should love your enemy. And, and I, when I heard that, for some reason, my heart just, um, you know, I was, I just, something happened here that I just felt so peaceful. I said, what kind of religion it is to teach you, you know, to not hate your family, your, your, your enemy. And then miraculously, I started to go to church and then I just became, um, um, you know, a happy person, a happier person. And the minister, Mr. Chen and his wife were very nice to me and they often helped us. And so that was my story. And my two younger brothers also became Christians individually. You know, they just went to church, you know, because they probably follow our example. So before my father came home from prison, we were already Christians. But my, when, when my father, was in jail, you know, in prison. Um, I mean, he was innocent from the very beginning. Even uh, Mr. Gu later, come, uh, you know, and, and admitted that, that my father was innocent. The reason he put my father in the prison was because of my 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 great my 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 uncle, my jiu jiu uncle, who was a communist. So really because of this family connection that, that my father was wrongly accused because they wanted to know where my uncle was and my mother, my father didn't know or he wouldn't tell them. Okay, so, um, um, he, you know, and then when my father was, uh, was in jail, he was, he was teaching English to the uh, other prisoners and he was reading the Bible and he was uh, teaching the Bible class, but then actually he was not a Christian. He did not believe in, uh, you know, he, 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 did not the real, he did not have the real faith, faith, you know, when he was teaching the Bible. After he left the, the jail, uh, after he came out of the jail, he was still not a Christian. Uh, but then just one day, he, uh, my mother forced him to go to church with, him, uh, with her. And then just from then on, he just be became to be very, very, you know, uh, devoted to the church. And then gradually he became, a so finally everybody <laughs> became a Christian. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah, that's very beautiful, actually. And uh, yeah, but th this is a very good input for, for all of us who are wondering <laughs> while reading the book, how that came to be, because while I was writing the historical guide, I was also studying a little, you know, about, about Christianity in general in Taiwan. And, and I still didn't see the connection. So now, now we know this, this is really beautiful. Thank you very much. And your second question? Yeah, my second question is about a, a language identity that you talked about. Um, uh, the, the, the chapter about it in the book is very interesting, how you lost your mother tongue and then you found another and then you found another and then maybe 
you know, uh, it came back to you while you were in America. So I, I'd just like to ask you to maybe kind of elaborate uh, on that topic a little bit more. And, and maybe if that's not too daring to tell us how you feel today, you know, like identity wise, uh, who, who you feel you, you are right now. You, you've been living in America for, for like many years now, right? Mm -hmm. you, you have an American citizenship and everything. Uh, but, but then you have your roots and but then you have your roots in the Chinese mainland and everything, you know, so, so how, how does that feel? I think the, the, the readers and, and the, the audience today could be interested in that. Yes. And I add, up, I add up one remark to this question. I remember when we spoke about the book uh, or yes, about the book, you told me that you wrote it in English first mm -hmm. and then you started writing it in Chinese. Mm -hmm. And that it was not easy for you, uh, mm -hmm. that you trained yourself to write in Chinese uh, mm -hmm. this type of text. So maybe this may be also part of it, because this was amazing for me. You, I know you as a, as a great scholar of Chinese literature, and I never doubted <laughs> that, <laughs> that you would write your memoirs in Chinese. And suddenly you told me you wrote them in English, and, and writing rewriting them in Chinese was not an easy task. Well, you know, I, I have to uh, uh, compliment um, our, our friend Tisha for asking such wonderful questions. Losing the, the first language, mother tongue, was so important to me too, so traumatic, so, so traumatic. But then at first, I, of course, I was a child, I didn't know. First of all, we, 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 we ran away from Taipei to South Taiwan where nobody was speaking Peking dialect, nobody. So, so, I mean, naturally I would probably lose my mother tongue anyway, you know, because when my father was still at home, I, I was speaking real Beijinghua, real Beijinghua, okay? So then right after that, I would think that like a, about a few weeks, I just lost my mother tongue, you know, because, because I want to identify myself with the Taiwanese there. In, in, in South Taiwan. So I only knew how to say tai, tai, Taiwan dialect, uh, you know, for, for about one, one year. And then later, when I went to the, the uh, uh, primary school, the, the teachers started to teach us Taiwan Guoyu, you know, Taiwanese Chinese Mandarin. And you know that Taiwan was occupied by Japan for 50 years. So very few teachers knew how to speak Mandarin in the correct way. They would mix Taiwan uh, uh, Mandarin with, with Taiwanese and with uh, uh, Japanese. Sometimes they would say, but is that you know, I have no idea what he was saying. He would use something like menkyo, okay, menchang or something, you know, in Japanese. And, and, and so I was really mixed up in my language, but at least I was speaking Taiwanese. But then I later learned a Taiwanese uh, Mandarin. And later I was often laughed at when I, uh, when I was older, when I went to Kaohsiung, you know, to enter the um, middle, uh, middle school and high school, people thought, wow, you are a countryside person, okay, because of, of my accent. And I, I never dared to tell them that I was born in Beijing. And of course, I never told them about my father's, uh, uh, you know, prison experience. And actually, many of my classmates didn't know about my story until they read my uh, uh, journey through the White Terror several decades later. They couldn't believe it because I never talked about it. And because of my Taiwanese uh, Mandarin, I became very, um, I, you know, that I, I was very worried about my accent. So I never wanted to speak the Taiwanese Mandarin, and at the same time, I couldn't learn the real Mandarin back. Yeah, so I thought that escaping to the church, you know, the, and especially the, the Catholic uh, uh, church and, and the, the, uh, in front of um, um, middle school and also the uh, Protestant church. I went to both churches, you know, and, and I was uh, uh, seeking help, you know, from, uh, from those sisters, you know, in, in the church. And then later I went to Donghai University and that was the first time that I learned how to speak English 
Before that, I was just reading English. I could read many, many books in English, but I couldn't say anything. And then in Donghai, it was in Donghai, a Christian university, where all the teachers in the English department were either Americans or Britons um, in a major in English and language, you know, just to learn everything in English and, and writing in English. And so I did not write things in Chinese. I was just writing my papers in English. Uh, that was uh, from uh, uh, since uh, I was 18. So then I wanted to escape from Taiwan because I thought the only way to escape from Taiwan was to get a, a, a you know a, a a fellowship you know an admission to this country so I came to this country and then later we settled down here and then so um, when I was talking with Olga Professor Olga then there was many years later I was so worried I said I almost forgot how to write Chinese so uh, there was uh, actually since nineteen um, 93, I, I, I just began to practice writing Chinese. So then I began to do publish books in Chinese, publish books in English at the same time. But speaking in any language is difficult for me. Speaking in English is difficult for me too. I talk with accent in any language. You know, I mean, having an accent is a trouble for me. So that's why I always like to give people my books rather than presenting in a lecture. <laughs> because I was kind of, but then the thing is, I have no identity crisis, uh, unlike most Chinese, because I have no identity. I, my identity is just wherever I go, like now, I consider myself just a citizen of the world, you know, and I'm an American citizen, but I'm very grateful to the United States because it saved my life, actually. Yeah, and, and I, I, I just couldn't believe it. It was in America that I discovered my Chinese roots. You know, this is ironic because in Taiwan, I tried to escape, you know, from my, my, my roots in, 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 in Chinese literature or anything because I wanted to make sure that I could get out, right? So it was in America that I discovered my cultural roots in, in, in China, yeah. <laughs> Incredible, very interesting. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, are there are there any further questions? Are there any raised hands? Otherwise, I will ask my question. No, I don't see raised hands, or you raise your voice. <laughs> uh, I, I have one perhaps last question. You just said that. You are a citizen of the world. I would say you are a citizen of world literature, I would say. <laughs> because uh, something what really impressed me in your book was the importance of literature for you. Yes, how reading literature, uh, be it uh, English language literature, Chinese literature, uh, was so essential for for you in life not not as a, and then eventually you have become scholar but uh, but uh, even if you eventually choose different subject and didn't become professor of literature uh, you still would have literature with you as something very important as far as i understand in the book can you say a few words you you spoke about discovering religion can you say a few words about discovering literature Yes, yeah. You see, you you both so much. You're so very good questions. You see, I I I, I could be called 读书人 in Chinese. 读书人 in Chinese meaning a uh, book reading person. Book reading person. When we escaped to South Taiwan, you know, to Kaohsiung, I was so lonely, so sad that I just bury my head in books naturally. And I just, so I was a, a, a book reader, you know, um, all the time, you know, and I was reading translations of European novel, you know, uh, uh, Don Quixote and, and Dante, even when I was very young, when I didn't really understand what I was reading, I was reading those, those books. And I, I thought, this is funny, because in Taiwan, we were not allowed, at that time, we were not allowed to read Lu Xun, Sen Chongwen, 
all those major writers on China. So there was nothing really good to read. So I thought, you know, as a child, as a young uh, student, I thought the great literary works were by Westerners, not by Chinese. This is funny. Not until when I came to America that I discovered that, oh, I could read Wu Lushen and I could read those. Because in those days, in my earlier education, there was no Lu Xun, no Sun Chongwen, nothing. So I was just reading English literature, everything, uh, translation though, because at that time, I, I did not learn how to read English until 12 years old. And, 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 then, uh, and then I was, uh, so at 12 years old, I started to read Bible uh, in Chinese translation, cover to cover, cover to cover. Okay, but then I still didn't know how to pronounce those names in English until later when I went to Donghai University. Okay, so I kept reading. So Du Shuren is a generic term referring to people who read books all the time. Uh, and, and they sometimes they would write essays, poetry uh, or something. Uh, 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 and, and often without any academic ambitions, you know, that was Du So I didn't, I didn't think that I would become a scholar. I would have, I would never have imagined that I could later, you know, actually uh, uh, come to um, uh, United States and then pursue my future career here. Yeah, and and then of course I just read in books all the time. Even now, I just I'm just so interested in reading. So I'm a Du Shuren book reading person. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think there are more Du Shuren uh, uh, around this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, there is opportunity for one last question. So and if, if, if there I may, are no questions. If, if I may. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Safe or, uh, so, so greetings from uh, Boston, and uh, I uh, I would like to because I wanted to ask about uh, what what do you think about the position of uh, classical Chinese poetry in a contemporary Taiwan because uh, because I, I saw that you study uh, Chinese poetry. But then when I was listening to you, I actually uh, thought that I maybe already found the answer that uh, I thought that maybe in uh, Taiwan, that the contemporary society is kind of trying to escape from China. So maybe today uh, uh, it's not the most popular, popular topic, but if Taiwan manages to escape from China, it will maybe become uh, again uh, uh, some like cultural heritage that can be somehow rediscovered in its full importance and, and so on. Uh, do you agree with this a uh, little bit uh, simplified uh, mm -hmm. idea or, or what what do you think about uh, uh, relation of contemporary Taiwanese students, for example, to classical Chinese poetry? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you, Martin, for asking uh, this question. I'm very worried about Taiwan, actually. I'm very worried because uh, um, earlier, uh, I mean, um, you know, Taiwan was obviously the, um, uh, uh, the, the place where it inherits the so-called classical literature. You know, if you go to Gu Gong Bo Wu Yuan, you know, the, uh, the, the, the palace museum, you know, all those treasures, amazing treasures of ancient China, pre-modern China were there. So amazing, so amazing. And actually I have to say that in 1979, when I visited uh, China, you know, the first time after I left, you know, several decades uh, before, I saw, I thought at that time, the, the palace museum in Beijing was empty, nothing at all. And, and I was just looking around and I said, where are those things? And in my mind, I thought they are in Taipei. They are in Taipei, you know, and that was in 1979. And so when I was in Taiwan, although I said that I wanted to escape from Taiwan, I still knew, you know, that classical, you know, this classical tradition 
was the thing that Taiwan inherited. And I was actually very grateful, you know, deep down in my heart, although I never had a former education in classical Chinese literature until I came to the United States, right? But then I knew that that was what Taiwan did. But now the situation really worries me. You know, the uh, younger uh, generation uh, students don't read classical literature and they are trying to uh, uh, get away, you know, uh, from a classical literature. They are trying to, to, um, uh, to, to, to revise their, 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 their uh, textbooks. Uh, and, and, and I think to me, it is a problem of the laws of the canon canon. I mean, mm -hmm. even, uh, even in America, I remember that years ago, my friend uh, who died, uh, you know, two years ago, Harold Bloom, you know, wrote about this, you know, this canon, right, the Western canon. And he was worried about how the popular culture in America would make the uh, younger uh, people forget about the Western canon. So in, in Taiwan, very soon, these young people, younger people will forget about the canons in liter uh, literature. And also for, for those people who did not want to be reunited with China, they also try for, to forget about it. They try to get, get away with that kind of connection with China. Yeah, so I have no idea what the future Taiwan holds, but I'm not as worried because right now Chinese literature has become universal somehow. You know, I mean, uh, it's, uh, uh, this, I'm so glad that people all over the world were, are now so interested in China and then Taiwan too, you know, like Czech. And, and I have to give you a compliment. When I, I just love Prague so much. I wish, I wish, you know, because of our health issues, I could not travel anymore. I, I, every time I, I dream about uh, Prague, you know, when I went to Prague, it, it, especially that trip, you know, in, in two, 2006, I just admire that city so much. And, and I remember that Olga organized the opera and all those places and then also the countryside and everywhere. And I went everywhere and, and I remember my husband was just visiting every corner of that city. And, and, and we, we just love Prague so much. And I think I'm so just so grateful that now uh, all over the world, people know about China and know about Taiwan too. Did, I, did I answer your question, Martin? Yes, yes. <laughs> thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. I wouldn't be so pessimistic. I mean, on one side, it's a universal feature. Young mm -hmm. people are not, are not, majority of them don't want to be too sure, yes. But at the same time, I'm optimistic <laughs> because there will always be a minority. Uh, and through the minority, literature will live on mm -hmm. classical and modern as well. Uh, okay. I can see there are no more questions. So I, I thank you, Professor Kang Yi Sun Zhang, for joining us for this discussion. I immensely enjoyed. Uh, I thank the translator who joined us, and I was happy to see my student after several years not seeing him. Uh, I thank all the participants uh, and uh, those who are Czech and can read Czech, I recommend buying the book. You can buy it online. Uh, it's also a, an ebook. And for those who don't read Czech, go to the Chinese or English edition if you didn't read the book yet. I very much recommend. It's full of insight and also joy, and ple it's a pleasure to read. Yeah. Thank I you wonder... all. And uh, see you again sometime, somewhere. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank Bye. you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye. Bye. And and thank you, Chris. You know, uh, 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 Edison. You know, for joining the, the the you know the event. Oh, thank you for the invitation. This is wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be thank in touch.
and and thank you, Xue Chen and Sui Yun. No worries, no problem. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. See you soon. Uh, thank you so much. It was very nice. We are happy. We are um, two Czech students who are currently uh, in Taiwan. So we enjoyed this uh, meeting.